A good afternoon, good morning. Scott Luton and Greg White here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's live stream. Uh, today's episode, we're answering a call that we've heard far and wide from business leaders that are really looking for best practices for ideas, in some cases, some reassurances of what other companies are doing to get through these challenging times. You know, they're, they're looking for sound advice and best practices, and we're really pleased here today as we, our team at Supply Chain Now works over drops to facilitate this information dissemination. Uh, today's show, we're able uh, in short order to arrange a home run speaker, folks, uh, uh, a speaker that comes uh, uh, highly recommended to us from a friend of the show. And he's going to be sharing key information and guidance as to this landscape that we find ourselves in. So uh, but one one really big message we want to communicate to the marketplace, a constant theme that you're going to hear in a lot of our programming. You know, we want our listeners to know that we're going to get through this. Now's not the time to panic. You know, it's challenging. We get that. But, um, you know, you don't you don't feed into the panic and you're able to make decisions better. And um, uh, we're just going to have to work our way through it. So I want to welcome in on today's live stream, my fearless esteemed co-host, Mr. Greg White, serial supply chain tech entrepreneur chronic disruptor, trusted advisor, and birthday boy today. Greg, good morning. Dude, you gave me up on global <laughs> television. Uh, yeah, thank you. Look, Happy hey, 27th. Yeah, thank you. Again, my 27th birthday twice. Um, so, <laughs> hey, look, let's put it this way. I just moved into a different risk category for coronavirus. So <laughs> at, yesterday I, was, I had much better chance. So, uh, <laughs> hey, look, you got to keep it light. Um, but anyway, hey, I'm looking forward to this. First of all, big fan. Uh, my wife is from Tempe, Arizona. We spent a lot of time on Mill Avenue, really looking uh, to hearing from Chichendra and, and uh, what he's all about and what he's done. Such an impressive background. Let's get going. Absolutely. So with no further ado, I want to welcome in uh, our, our featured guest today, Tendra Chattervetti. Uh, he is the professor of practice with one of the world's leading supply chain institutes, uh, as Greg mentioned. Uh, it's the W.P. Carey Supply Chain Management Program at Arizona State University. And um, you know, good morning uh, to you, Hatendra. Good morning. Thanks so much for making time. I, I know it's, uh, it's, it's a, a unique time for so many. And appreciate you joining us here short notice to um, really share five, a variety of things that business leaders need to know. But in particular here, uh, uh, as we get our way through this interview, to pick your brain on five things that, that supply chain leaders and business leaders need to keep in mind as we look to navigate through uh, this yeah, environment. So, Greg, where yeah, are we going to so start you, today? Yeah. So let's start with you have a fascinating background. And I think. Before we get into the heavy stuff, I think it would be great for people to hear kind of where you came from, a little bit about your background and your professional journey. Can you start us off there? Sure. <clears throat> um, a little bit of a, um, I, was, I was born and raised to the foothills of the Himalayas. So when I used to wake up, I, uh, the Himalayas were my background. And um, uh, uh, I used to take it for granted. It's only after I left that place that I realized uh, what I was missing. When I come to Arizona and I see hills. <clears throat> so, um, uh, the, did, my, did my engineering. I'm a computer engineer uh, by trade uh, from one of the IITs of India. And then came to the U.S. in 1990 to get a graduate degree uh, from LSTO of all the places. An amazing computer science program. So, go Tigers. Um, and um, breaking Scott's heart. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that was very deliberate, by the way, Scott. <laughs> I'm sure that it was. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> after that, my MBA is from uh, Texas SMU. Uh, and uh, interestingly, um, used to work. Uh, so, again, go Mustangs. SMU did my MBA in 1995, uh, was taking, I was a full-time student and working two jobs, one at a Chaparral Steel Company, 40 miles south of Dallas in Midlothian, and um, um, could only afford a bike, so had a Honda VFR at that moment, and uh, this is when I had sold my Ninja ZX-11 uh, at Dallas. I like the way you live. <laughs> 
Oh gosh, <laughs> not anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> uh, I, I used to have a lot of friends at Midlothian in Texas uh, had Harleys, so they used to just um, um, joke about how I'm riding a rice burner or a crotch rocket. <laughs> yep. And uh, but became great friends with uh, steel-toed boots, hard hats and uh, jackets. Um, so I was doing production scheduling, inventory management. Uh, joined Ernst & Young Management Consulting. Did a lot of work in supply chain procurement for the airline industry, for retail. Um, Southwest Airlines, as a matter of fact, was a very big customer of mine. And then um, joined AT Kearney. Um, into strategy, started uh, um, uh, their e-commerce practice. And uh, build it up to about three hundred million dollars in about three years. I'm talking about late 1990s, the heydays of e-commerce. Oh yeah. And um, um, the reason I don't tell dates is people start to guess my age then. But that's okay. <laughs> We're all there. No, so, well, I'm not. I'm not 27 anymore, Greg. <laughs> so, uh, None of us are. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was. Um, I used to ride my motorcycle about 40 miles south early morning. I still remember there was an Albertsons uh, on the way. And uh, because a poor graduate student living hand to mouth, uh, used to pick up four bagels. I remember uh, 25 cents a bagel, early morning, 6 o'clock, four bagels, two uh, very rich, strong, sugary coffee for breakfast, and then two bagels for lunch, and used to come back. And uh, Texas had a pizza chain called Mr. Gaddy's. I don't know if oh, you yeah. remember. Okay. So uh, that used to be my dinner, all you can eat for five bucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so funny thing, Tendra, we had a Mr. Gaddy's in Aiken, South Carolina, where I grew up. Uh -huh. And it was famous not only for its that $5 buffet, but the best and latest coin-operated video games. Ah, okay. and and the big screen that was powered by the you know in the eighties or early nineties, the the three colored lights. Remember those big uh -huh. screens that was produced yeah, yeah, projection. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was a place to be in Aiken, and that exactly, was definitely place yes. in Texas. <clears throat> All the football games we used to watch on that big screen, three colored. Yeah, you're right. And the, their dessert pizza. That was That's the reason right. I used to go there, and uh, <laughs> as part of the buffet. And so. Um, A.T. Kearney, build the business up, uh, took a bunch of companies, uh, barnesandnoble.com, uh, our international paper, Hocktief and Turner. Uh, E-commerce was just amping up. A lot of work mm. supply chain related areas. After, um, after A.T. Kearney, um, we did a lot of work with investors. So one of them came to me and said they had uh, funded a company in reverse logistics called uh, Austin Ventures. Oh, sorry, called Neogistics. So I became part of the core team that started Neogistics in Austin, Texas. Uh, my wife was in Dallas and, uh, and um, I was in Austin and too much of traveling. That's when my uh, elder daughter was born. So we decided to cut down on travel. Microsoft came calling, both of us moved to Seattle. Our life kind of took over and uh, worked for Microsoft in Seattle for about five years in um, go-to-market uh, strategy, competitive strategy, uh, and then OEM business. They moved me to Asia to manage the OEM business there. Uh, two years, uh, I was supposed to be back up to two years, but uh, unfortunately, when I landed there, I lost my dad, and I had to take care of my mom, so I quit Microsoft. This is 2008. And um, <clears throat> height of recession, nobody told me that. Right. Uh, so I decided to quit Microsoft and became an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And the business was in reverse logistics. I started, uh, uh, as of now, India's largest uh, reverse logistics company called Green Dust. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as a matter of fact, um, Chuck Johnson uh, was uh, on my advisory board, um, who is uh, now with GoTRG. Um, so um, build it up to about $100 million, uh, 260 retail outlets, online and offline, um, over 2,000 employees. Um, started in the height of recession. If I would have known then what I know now, I would have been too scared. So ignorance was bliss. That's right. 
Ignorance um, is entrepreneurship, frankly. There you right? go. You, Absolutely. You, you, and I keep on telling the same to my students too. Um, and then I've been involved with, um, started, started another company in blockchain and electronic waste management that failed. Um, I talk about that company only when I'm drunk. Um, <laughs> I'd love to talk about that company with you at some point. Ben. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to buy me a single malt. Um, I have a feeling that's one of my birthday gifts. So there you go. I'm stocked up. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Lagavulin and uh, Oban, and uh, those are my my. My poison. I'm sent, I'm and texting I'm, you my address right now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Attention. And, I, and, and, I, and I got into winemaking. As a matter of fact, uh, people call it very corny, but this is your dad speaking. So my elder daughter, when she was born, uh, she did uh, like you, you have kids and she did her finger painting. Yeah. <clears throat> and I saw the finger painting and I looked at it and I'm like, and I took a picture of that and I said, this could be a great wine label. And uh, so what I did was I sent it to a company and I said, make a label out of it. And they sent me back a label. It reminds me of my wife. She goes and buys a pair of shoes and said, I don't have a dress to go with it. So I changed the wrong address. <laughs> so I had a wine label and I said, I don't have wine. So I learned how to make wine. And 2005 is when I made the first batch um, um, in my house, uh, about 250 bottles. Syrah, and why I bring up the point about being a dad is um, it's a finger painting of my elder daughter, and um, I have about 100 bottles stored in a climate control in Bellevue in Washington State. And I have told her that the day she gets married, one case will be given to her as her wedding gift, and that is the only time she'll be allowed to drink. <laughs> Thing, I guess. Let, if I so could. I'd just like to get this clear. Yeah, go ahead. You're you're a biker and a bootlegger. So you are the American dream. You're I'm a not biker, a bootlegger entrepreneur. So. I'm not a bootlegger. I'm making <laughs> hand sanitizers. There you go. There you go. So there you go. that's you know, outstanding. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about wine. Uh, we've already talked about single malt. You know, I get the feeling that plenty of adult beverages are being consumed here in recent weeks. Uh, probably so today, during this show. Pro probably so. But Hatendra, today, just a little aside, what's, what is your favorite wine? You mentioned Syrah, which you know, we're big fans of here. What's your go-to? My go-to wine, you want to talk about the brand or the grape, grape kind? Either one. So my, my um, the grapes I love are Cabernet. Um, I love uh, Syrah, so I'm more of a full-bodied, not very oaky, uh, with a structure to it, good tannins. So people who love single malt scotch have a typical, so um, lighter wines, there are some good Merlots, like the corn Merlot is very, very nice. Uh, California wines have become too expensive, so I go to those smaller wineries that make, like Paul Porteous in Yakima outside of Washington is one of my favorites. So the um, nice cab, nice Syrah, nice blend. Uh, Tuscan wines are some of my favorites too. So um, Australian wines, Chilean wines. I have lived and traveled across 75 countries. So trust me, it is very hard to say that this is what I love. More you know, more you realize, the less you know. Right. And the more you love, right? The more I mean you love. You, you love more, this little thing about that wine and that little thing about another wine. And it's hard to pick a favorite. You're right. It's like I, I tell people when they say that, what wine should I choose? I said, um, uh, the friend that I, my best friend may not be the friend person that you may like, but he's my best friend. So it doesn't make him bad or good. It's like your choice. You pick up what you love. Yeah. So to finish the story, it was... Uh, uh, after I and then the third company is in supply chain again, predictive diagnostics and artificial intelligence. And um, uh, so, second company obviously will sit and talk over a scotch. But the third company, artificial. So I'm I'm not I'm not in operations role, but I'm an advisor. I I have I, I have shares in that. Um, and then uh, what was happening was a little bit of a personal touch to it. My younger daughter was having humongous pollution problems and. Um, she couldn't breathe. She was, uh, she was, um, 
she was snoring in the, in, in the night and having a very tough time breathing. She was snoring like an adult. We took her to the doctor and um, uh, they recommended surgery. And so we, mm. me and my wife, we decided uh, we got to do something for the family, enough of the four hour nights. And uh, so we, I, I, I have been a guest speaker at Stanford, uh, Purdue, SMU, love teaching. So decided to open a third chapter in my life, exited all my companies. And it was a choice. Uh, the choice to ASU was very simple because it is one of the top supply chain universities. And uh, when they gave me an offer, uh, we came in last uh, fall, August is when we came here and um, uh, decided to uh, become a faculty. So I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing it because um, I just love this. Great place to have kids, especially if they've got respiratory issues, <laughs> right? As you've learned, the valley around Phoenix is people flock there if they have allergies and things like that. And it, it is, you know what, it's a beautiful place. I come from a very flat part of the States, Kansas, and it's a fascinating place to see hills and just kind of envision those cowboy movies. You, you can almost see them riding over the, the top of those hills. A great spirit there, a very um, pioneering and entrepreneurial spirit. Um, yeah. Wow, what a great place. I'm a huge no, I, fan. Uh, Greg, you're absolutely right. And I'm a pilot, so I fly. I have a, I have a, I have a Bonanza that I fly out of uh, Gateway Airport. And places I go, Monument Valley, I've, I've yeah. been away. Um, uh, Sedona, <clears throat> it's just the, the, the peace and the quiet of Sedona is uh, uh, yeah. the picture behind me you see is that of Monument Valley, actually. I love uh, to both of you gentlemen. I can picture this as you paint these pictures. And we were out in Arizona uh, as part of the Demska conference, uh, Diversify our uh, Diverse Supply Chain Manufacturing Association um, uh, back in late February. And it was my first time in Arizona. And what you're both describing, it is, it is, Greg, I think you put it with the landscape out there. You could, it was, it wasn't hard at all to do, to picture folks riding off into the sunset. It was such a, uh, a powerful uh, visual landscape. Um, so let, if I could go back before we, before we kind of shift gears, uh, into offering some really practical insights to business leaders, supply chain leaders, you name it. It seems like to me that of your journey that you uh, were sharing with us, uh, at Tendra, the reverse logistics role, I mean, back, I mean, I, these days, I think, and one of the common folks we uh, have in our network is Tony Sheroda executive director of the Reverse Logistics Association. We were just in Vegas uh, back in February as part of their annual conference. And it, it's so neat to see that finally the reverse logistics, the folks that, that are handling returns and figuring out how to, how to uh, much more effectively process all of that these days, they're finally starting to get some of their due. You know, some their folks and consumers, I think even, are starting to really understand the importance of folks that get reverse logistics. It seems like you were part of the the front edge of that. Speak speak to your time in reverse logistics at that time in industry. Um, <clears throat> reverse logistics. My belief. My belief is um, reverse logistics is going to morph. Uh, reverse logistics as a word, I hate it. I absolutely hate it because it does not do justice to the work that has been done by this industry. In my opinion, reverse logistics is going to morph into something called either sustainability or circular economy. The thing that has made me extremely angry about reverse logistics is that in most of the companies, reverse logistics is given to people uh, who are supply chain people as a weakened job or something that you, they're not measured on, something which is a thankless job. And um, it has always been treated as a redheaded stepchild of any corporation or any company for that matter. And that has made, uh, th th that is very unfortunate. So I believe that, um, and I've just written a white paper uh, talking about how companies need to incorporate the concept of reverse logistics and sustainability and it should be put on the chief operating officer's agenda. 
And that and those key performance indicator from sales and marketing to product design to uh, after sales service to supply chain to warehouse management, all of them should have an element of sustainability and that should be integrated into their entire supply chain rather than calling reverse logistics as a different discipline. So I'm, I'm making a radical statement here. I believe that we should kill RL as a discipline because it is the, the just the term RL has done a huge disservice to RL. Whenever you talk about reverse logistics to companies, the only thing that they talk about is I have these return items sitting in my warehouse and I've got to get my maximum yield out of it. How do I sell these items and where do I sell it to get a maximum yield? And that's not RL. And I and, and I, I'm sorry, I'm making a very. Um, uh, I think that's that's an impassioned plea. That's what I would say. I'm First showing all, you I'm, where I have struck reverse logistics from my prep. Uh, thank you very much, Atendra. <laughs> so, so look, we've had this conversation just recently, and um, I love the term circular economy. I think of, I think what we discovered when we were in Vegas, Atendra, with um, the Reverse Logistics Association was it is much more about circular. And if you think about it, it is just another segment of the supply chain. There is retail, distribution, manufacturing, and circular, whatever, whatever, you know, we, we'll, we'll shake that out over the coming years, but circular is so much more an integrated part of where the economy and the supply chain is going that this could, and you've been in supply chain long enough to see this happen. This could go from the bottom of the, of the list to the top, to the top over of the time. Yeah. Right. Why I, mean, I say that is, uh, and I and I make these statements at times, and I talk to students. No, none of my students they want to be a reverse logistics professional. In the academia roundtable that we had, uh, people are like, "Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god!" We don't have people coming in to join us. I said, "I said, okay, we will teach students about reverse logistics. Give me a job description of a reverse logistics professional." Is it different from a supply chain professional? Yeah. No, it's not. And the other yeah. thing I made was exactly. look at the students in my class. They love to work in sustainability. Nobody wants to work in reverse logistics. Great point. There's a big, huge disconnect that we've got to figure out how to bridge. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing about circular is it starts at the beginning. It has to start with design Yes. for recycling, reuse, right, redeployment, whatever. It, it has to start with design. And if you think about it from that perspective, that allows even people who arguably, Hitendra, are not in supply chain today, merchandisers. The people that I, I had this role when we lived in in Phoenix that select or design yes. and, and make a market for the product. You have to think about the end of life for that product starting at the beginning. And if you do it that way, it does become a very circular. The chief, in my in my opinion, the chief operating officer should be the chief circular economy czar of the company. That's good. Love that. Love um, that. We might steal that from you, Hitendra. We, we might owe you some commissions on the idea or something. But <laughs> hey, so we're going to shift gears. <laughs> we're going to shift gears because I want to start picking your brain kind of as we're um, advertising. Uh, and and I, think ben I think folks benefit from experiences. And, and one of the reasons why we ask about folks journey is that there's always something to be gained and clearly plenty from your journey <clears throat> but before we shift gears I'm, I'm 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 turning my head because i'm i'm looking at a separate monitor i want to give a a quick shout out to uh aa uh who is in wichita uh greg uh he's tuned in i think he is a, a doctoral researcher at wichita, wichita state oh University. yeah right yeah uh, we have leah we've got lisa Go shocks that's right. Good shocks. Uh, Stassi, uh, Luis, and Tevin Taylor uh, with FedEx that also was out in Vegas with us uh, at the Reverse Logistics Association. That's, that'll be the last time I say that those two words with you, Atendra. Um, but <laughs> We're going to have to call Tony and have him change the name. But, that's right. But a lot of interest. Uh, appreciate everyone joining us for what we find really to be a fascinating uh, conversation yeah. here. So, Let's shift gears as much as I feel like I'd love to, you know, kind of dive in deeper into 
the chapters of your journey. And there's so much to be gained there. But we want to uh, shift over into some of the things that business leaders and supply chain leaders really need to be thinking about given the backdrop of COVID-19 and the coronavirus and the upending of the world as we know it, uh, not to be too dramatic, you know, uh, a lot of businesses are clamoring for what do we do and what are other companies doing? So what I really like that as we've kind of packaged this, it, it, is there's five clear cut things that as you're surveying the landscape based on that, all of your experience, that you're advising companies to think about. Is that right? That is correct. That is absolutely correct. As a matter sure. of fact, <clears throat> there is one more, there is one more um, dimension to what I shared with you earlier, I'm gonna throw out, is a big difference between, um, so what has been talked about what companies should be doing uh, is been there are four or five key things. But the thing that, gets to me is there is a big difference between the same advice to a large company versus a small company, mm, the SME. Well, the reason I say that is um, many of the advisors that work for a large company in this, in this, in this, what I call the twilight zone is going to be extremely hard for, from some of the smaller businesses to adopt. And that is where we need some help and immediate help from either the government or from the consumers. So what is happening is, if you look at um, if you look at the advisors that are out there, let me try and see if I can just share with you one slide. Sure. It will if it. Um, and we'll, we can make that work on the fly. So if you want to share your your separate your second screen. Yeah, I I'm just we'll going be able to. to uh, Okay, and um, there was just one. Hey, um, so Clay, we're gonna we're gonna do you know this is spontaneous. Don't worry about it. Spontaneous. Um, let's see how can we show. I have a PowerPoint slide. This one. Okay. Can you see it? Can you make him share it? That's okay. <laughs> if, 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 yeah, it's okay. We'll imagine. Let's see. Don't how worry about it. Don't worry about it. it. Yeah, let me talk about it. Let me <laughs> yeah. uh, really quickly talk about it. See, what is happening is that uh, the the standard five key advices that people are giving to companies, and it makes it makes sense, uh, is that uh, one is that um, um, carry a little bit of inventory. Okay, uh, great. But carry a little bit of inventory. Uh, just in time was the fashion. Let's make it a just in case store some inventory closer to your customers mm. and it makes perfect sense for large customers and uh, sorry large players global players uh, the second advice that has been given to the companies is that um, uh, segregate your manufacturing supply chain from your r d supply chain and product development supply chain because if you look at an apple their supply chain of r d of new product development as well as existing product manufacturing is all done by foxconn so with Foxconn shutting down or China shutting down here, not only the existing models, but also the future design and development of new models was come, came to a complete standstill. Right. Um, the third point is that let's do looks a little bit of local manufacturing. Let's bring it to the to our shores, 10 to 15 percent of manufacturing so that uh, you can scale it at the time. And then the fourth recommendation is that start to use technology. That is my recommendation. Um, more uh, robotic process automation, more artificial intelligence to predict and uh, do fire drills in terms of pandemic and so on and so forth. And um, so the problem with all of those recommendations is that for large companies, it's doable. But the moment you get into the SME space, that live check uh, uh, sales happen, and then uh, that money, the cash flow, is used to buy more products. They can't do this. A student of mine is uh, a gene manufacturer, and uh, in Arizona, they import hats from China, and the, and they are not able to do so. Customers are asking. They started to source from the U.S., and their acquisition price has gone up 100 percent. So his statement to me was, Professor, either I can 
absorb absorb their price or and lay off people or i pass it on to the customers which means you know, uh, inflation is going to increase yeah so or demand the, is going to decrease yeah the thing here is that the small businesses got creamed because one the supply constriction happened from asia and second the demand constriction happened here in the us so if you there is no solution other than giving them some support to handle their cash flow problems their biggest issue is cash flow and they are yep. the bones of our economy so even though my recommendations are recommendations that the companies are implementing today <clears throat> for large see and the, the the other worry i have is this coronavirus is going to cause a lot of small businesses to shut down in the itad business for example in the supply chain business for example you will see that hey uh attendra hey real quick i bet we've got some listeners and some audience members that are unfamiliar with the itad the itad oh, acronym could you just in a in a very small nutshell Sure, yeah. what that means. It is IT asset disposition. It is the uh, people who take your laptops and computers and wipe them off and they um, sell it into the market or resell them as refurbished items. So the Big point industry. I was trying to make, yeah, the point I was trying to make on this one is small businesses will die, and this makes the gap between the small and the large businesses even larger. and a lot of acquisition at throw away prices and uh, merger and acquisition opportunities will come out of this which will benefit the large companies at the expense of dying small and medium businesses mm. that's the concern i have in the economy today so if I, if i can go back uh, i think your third point was talking about um uh reshoring some of the manufacturing activity and I know probably all three of us and many of our audience members have seen plenty of the editorials and and um some of the analysts questioning if global supply chain is dead as I, as I saw one writer put it. I uh, saw plenty of other folks talking about how how this environment we're in is is going to dram dramatically shape global supply chain strategy moving forward. I can't help in the back of my mind as undoubtedly when we get through the other side of this and we look back and it becomes a business case and we do uh apply those learnings isn't it going to be just a matter of time before the almighty dollar still speaks very loudly and yeah, absolutely and correct i think and okay. the other thing you need to understand scott is that uh, our memories are very short mm. you're going to make you you'll see people making changes for the next 2 years and if things go back your almighty dollar is going to talk That's right. And your profit is going to talk. We are greedy inherently. We are a greedy species. <laughs> Six, seven, eight years out, it'll be back to square one. Yeah, I, I, I kind of. Greg, I know you're dying to weigh in here. What, I am what, dying. What are your thoughts? Well, two things. One, Hitendra, what makes you angry is different than what makes me angry. What makes me angry is reporters issuing opinions on supply chain because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So <laughs> that aside, um, what I, what I I am postulating, and as you're a professor, I'd like to raise my hand and ask this question in class. Um, because robotics are more and more a part of supply chain, and I think we've finally reached a stage in supply chain where we can cease to. apologize for robotics as costing people jo jobs because China has already done that in great measure because China has an 806 million dollar 806 million person uh workforce that cannot be replicated even in the combination of virtually every country on the planet i i feel like because of the necessity of diversifying sourcing and the ability of robotics to create efficient production that if we were to as a nation let's say here in the states or other places but certainly here in the states if we were to be more open to and allow robotics to become a part of production again that we could reasonably compete with 10 certainly 10 to 15% more production here in the states but possibly even more if you change the paradigm to 
uh, eliminate the costly labor, but elevate the role of the human in production to be managing robotics and that sort of thing, especially with this great tran generational transition going on. Do you see that as a possibility, as it's possible to embed robotics back into production and give us much, much greater production capacity? Absolutely. But it's a double-edged sword, uh, Greg. I'll tell you why. Uh, more robotics you bring in. And um, uh, Kai-Fu Lee, who's, an, who's a great uh, Chinese uh, investor and uh, entrepreneur, he has, he, he's invested, he's got, I believe, eight or 10 artificial intelligence startups he's invested in with their each and every one of their market cap, each and every one of them are a unicorn and they're all doing work in China. Over the last two and a half, three years, China has made humongous progress in terms of artificial intelligence, in terms of, in terms of robotics. So mm -hmm. answering, answering your question, uh, Greg, I think we have to make dramatic investments in robotic process automation and, be, and become more and more efficient uh, but the reason I say that it's, it's a double-edged sword is that it's going to cost jobs. So we will have to find new jobs for the people that these are robots are going to displace. That's one. Second well, point is, yeah, go sorry. ahead. What, what I'm thinking is that we don't displace people who are doing production in the States today. We displace people in China who are doing production at these unnaturally low rates and do you feel like we could supplement that? Yes, I think we can. I think we can absolutely do that. The only thing is that I don't think so. Companies here are maybe this coronavirus will push us more into RPA, robotic mm -hmm. process automation. Yeah. Maybe large companies will think selfishly and say that, um, uh, uh, you know what? Robots don't get coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So let me invest a bit more. And maybe yeah. when they start to make these investments in robots and uh, artificial intelligence, maybe they are bringing in production back home. And uh, I completely agree with you. Maybe this is a wake up call for us not to rely on um, automation only in China, but we have to create this entire new wave of uh, automation um, back home. Yeah. So if I can, I want to weigh in here real quick. Uh, we should give a, a big shout out to Mike McBride, who we mentioned earlier. He is with, as you as you suggested, Patendra, uh, Ingram Micro Commerce and Life Cycle Services. He spent a bunch of time in the ITAD arena. That is a big industry. It's a very important industry and it's growing in its in its importance and size. And Mike's the guy you want to talk to. So also Mike connected us with Patendra. Which is really important. Uh, that's that's what why we're here sharing his thought thought leadership. Thank you, Mike. You bet. Okay, so uh, I know we were talking technology and robotics and and what we heard. We were at Modex uh, a week or two ago, and, and despite some of the challenges of that, you know, one of the largest supply chain trade shows in the world, um, some of the attendance challenges. Despite all of that, we had a great week. And your point, both of your point, that you were referring to robotics is hotter than ever. And these robotics firms uh, that, that we were interviewing, rubbing elbows with, and kind of you know comparing notes with, um, it seems like the hot industry that is robotics and, and RPA and all this stuff is only going to get hotter because of, to your point, attendance, yes. the current environment. <clears throat> no, you're absolutely right. And um, uh, being part of... Um, uh, one of the top supply chain programs in the country, we are seeing students come up with some amazing ideas. We have to reignite the entrepreneurial spirit of this country, and it starts at universities. Um, and we have to work extremely hard in the area of artificial intelligence and what this could do to for us not to so heavily rely on um, so heavily... Obviously, and I believe that um, we will be working to, with other countries, but not to the extent that it just can bring this country to a standstill. Mm, mm, so we have to invest. We have to invest in our entrepreneurial spirit. We have to, what we were known for uh, was uh, innovation. Let's bring it back. 
Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I think. It, go ahead, Greg. I, I think that the this generational transfer will bring to both of those things, both the innovation and the adoption of of these kind of solutions. Because l- let's face it, n- nobody wants to do the the repetitive, menial, or dangerous jobs that occur in a supply chain anymore. And we have the means to to automate those. And those same people who are motiv- who are who are motivated uh, away from doing those jobs are the people who are motivated to use technology to yeah. solve business problems. And I can see a very nice uh, synchronization of those those identities as we as we go forward. And to your Great point, point, and to your point, um, new jobs. Who thought that sustainability will be the new job? Uh, people and there are younger generation. There are wanting jobs in sustainability. When I graduated, uh, I didn't even know how to spell sustainability. <laughs> right, <laughs> Make two of us. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So well, it, the evolution, the jobs will evolve with uh, robotics. We'll have, uh, we'll have. We just need to ensure a few things that, and this is something we all need to watch out for. If you see the chart of uh, productivity increases and the wages. The wages have remained constant, flat, while the productivity of our uh, economy has increased. That is something we have to very carefully watch out for because then you're going to create a very disgruntled workforce as large companies invest in artificial intelligence and robotics uh, and and stand behind uh, uh, the guard will be that we are doing it because we want to be more self-reliant, but the hidden agenda would be uh, what some people call surveillance capitalism. Some people talk about uh, displacement of jobs. As long as we are helping the American worker, as long as we are creating new jobs with their new profiles, um, I think I'm all for it. But if it creates something else and if the after effects are something that are a little bit more uh, malignant, uh, that will scare me. Yep. Okay. So let's, uh, as much as, as we'd love to bolt on a few extra hours here, we, let's start to kind of wind down the interview. Really appreciate your time, Patandra. Um, so what we want you to get, we want you to really weigh in on is, is, is something you mentioned early on in your, your, your five points, you know, don't panic. Right. So elaborate more on that and elaborate. Why, why is that so important? See, the biggest reason why people say, let's be cautious. Absolutely, let's be cautious. I would say, let's be abundantly cautious. The moment you panic, your brain stops to function. Then you see the videos in a retail store where three people are fighting over a single roll of toilet paper. Mm -hmm. Okay? Panic is when you start to worry about should I go to a Asian restaurant to have dinner? Panic is right. uh, when you say that I, if I drink chlorine, I'm going to kill the coronavirus. Not thinking the first it's going to kill you. That's the reason I'm worried about uh, uh, panic. Panic is when you start to believe all uh, 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 fake news, which says if you smoke a lot, you'll kill the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And uh, panic is when people tell you that if you drink cow's urine, it'll cure you of coronavirus. So those are the things that we should be very, very off, very careful about. Um, and uh, if we follow what our what CDC is telling us, the experts are telling us, we follow with an abundant caution. I think we will get over it. Mm-hmm. I believe we will. I believe it's. we have yet to see the bottom. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Sure, we need yeah. to prepare for it. There is a, it's, we have to just learn to now live with this new phenomenon. How we do that, what's our exit strategy, that is what we have to figure out. Great point. Uh, that Everyone needs to hear that. Uh, it's so important right now. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of inaccurate messages out there, a lot of fake news, as you put it. Uh, but but I, what I liked that uh, I think you touched on there and you certainly touched on in some of our pre-show uh, conversations is that your brain doesn't function as effectively. You can't make decisions, the decisions you need to make 
when you uh, give into the panic and, and you, you, you give into that psychology. So we're seeing a lot of consumers give into that with some of their purchasing behaviors, which is why, to some degree, we're seeing some of the empty shelves. And, and you know, to your point, we, we have to accept this current environment and the, dynam the dynamics that comes with it. But we don't have to accept the panic and the paranoia and the uh, fear of missing out, the FOMO that we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, play out. Greg. <laughs> the, look, the a lot of what we saw was demand acceleration, not really a demand increase. People bought two months worth of of toilet paper. And we've talked about this before. Uh, you know, another thing that struck me as you two were both um, were both sharing is that that's what makes a vehicle like this, like LinkedIn Live or other vehicles that allow real experts to sound off is we can not only we first of all, we don't have any agenda. We're not trying to sell advertising by sensationalizing the problem. And unfortunately, a dying media industry is doing that exact thing. We don't have any other agenda than to share the truth of how supply chains and economies and market dynamics work. And that's what makes a, a vehicle like this so, so valuable. And that's why people are flocking to vehicles like this and away from traditional media. Mm. So go to the people who know. Don't go to the people who go to the people who know that's just one you know that's the german telephone game so this is a great vehicle for that uh i'm glad people are joining us on this hitendra i am so glad that you've joined us and i really appreciate your extensive knowledge your expertise your sensibleness your beautiful painting in the back of your picture <laughs> that that if the world comes down now i know i have a place in arizona to stay that's right. Because I because I'll bring I will bring single malt, um, and and truthfully, uh, it's good to see you enunciate these things unequivocally, with your knowledge, with your distinct point of view, and to get that out to our viewers and listeners. And it is so valuable. So and how I cool? Just really appreciate it. Absolutely. How you know? Um, how cool would it be to have a professor like Hatendra? You're not taking anything away from all the wonderful educators out there, but to, to study supply chain with someone that's been there and done that uh, and, ha and can speak with that type of, um, of certainty, you know, really cool. I'm so glad we had you on. Let, let's make sure. So we're, we've been chatting with Hatendra yeah. Chattavetti, uh, professor of practice uh, at Arizona State University in, in that widely regarded, highly regarded uh, supply chain management. Uh, program. How can folks connect with you and also learn more about the program? Um, it's very easy. Uh, my email ID is, uh, and I think you could share with the viewers, um, hitendra.chaturvedi at asu.edu. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and um, um, asu.edu, WP Carey School of Business, uh, part of the faculty. The link is also over there. So happy to address any more questions. And thank Great. you for having me. You bet. Yeah, thank you. So I've got, I do have one more question. If you have yeah. one final thought, think about one 30 second final thought you want to challenge your audience with, and I can come back to you. That's why you think about that. Greg, uh, we also always want to offer actionable um, uh, 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 calls to action, right? On all of our yep. programming. And we've got a great thing coming up next week. Tell us more about it. March 25th. 3 p.m. to 4.30 U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, stand up and sound off. Bring your thoughts, your questions, your hopes, your fears, your joys, your pains. Bring anything that you want to say or anything you want to hear from other professionals in the industry. Show up and, and do. Share or absorb, join and speak, lurk and listen. Whatever you want to do, be there for uh, that and don't miss it. That's right. And folks, you can find that at uh, supplychainradio.com under the uh, webinars tab. It's, it's, we're using a webinar platform, which helps us facilitate it. But as Greg suggested, it's all about the audience. It's all about the, the professional community. We're simply going to help facilitate the informational exchange. You know, bring your what you're doing, what that's working. Bring what you're doing that's not working. 
uh, or just come and learn. So March 25th, 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Big thanks to EFT by Reuters Events, who is sponsoring the session. Uh, and, and learn more and sign up at supplychainradio.com. Okay. Yeah. So, Tendra. Tendra, if you want to join us, by the way, Happy please to. do. I think, it, I think it would be great. Happy oh, to. yeah. So it's like it's like signing Hulk Hogan to a, a wrestling match. Of course, we have to have uh, a Tendra. As, as he is the, of the rock discussion. of supply chain. <laughs> the rock of supply <laughs> chain. All right. So what's so one final challenge from you, Tendra, to our audience? One final thought. What do you think? My one final thought would be: <clears throat> social distancing and all is is fine, but uh, just can we find a way where we can show? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, Scott and Greg, anything that show that we care. Mm. I don't want social distancing to cause this effect of people don't care. How do we show to our elders? How do we show to people who, are, who need help with their grocery? How do we know, how do we tell people that uh, uh, you're not a pariah? Is there a way that we can uh, create a movement, at least a small movement in every city, every state that show we care for you? Mm. We are in it together. Mm. Um, I would challenge us to figure something out and start some sort of movement that shows we are here for you. We care for you. Mm. We will get through this together. I would love some wonderful ideas. I love mm. that idea. I, can, can I just share something really quick? I have a young Gen Zer who are taking a lot of heat right now. Um, she volunteered on her own without her parents' intervention to go buy groceries for her grandfather and bring them to him who wow. is at a, at, in a high risk, at a high risk age. Um, so that was a proud Papa moment, but I think it's those kind of things that we want to hear about and share, right? Hitendra? Maybe, maybe this will bring us more together. That's my hope. Maybe yeah, I'm seeing it. I don't know about you guys, but I see it all the time. Yeah. yeah. And find ways, find ways to display acts of kindness. This is, it's so important. If, Never more important in times like this. Wave okay. at somebody across the street. Let's start with something simple. That is correct. Right. Let's bring it together. Great point. Let's bring it together. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Common sense, actionable uh, insights. Appreciate you both. Okay. First off, big thanks to our guests that um, uh, join us on such short notice. You know, it's a crazy time for everybody, but I'm so glad that Mike McBride connected us and we were able to feature the Tendra uh, Chattervetti. Uh, with Arizona State University yeah. as part of uh, today's live stream. Big thanks. Uh, we'll make sure the links that he mentioned to learn more are, are featured as we publish this to YouTube and and as it's, this is published to our Supply Chain Now uh, LinkedIn page. Uh, Greg, great conversation. Appreciate you continuing to carve out time. I know we all have a thousand things on our mind and between our ears, but I, I guess the way I look at it, I've never seen a greater sense of purpose where we have to act to bring what we heard here today out to the community, out to the folks that are in their homes, quarantined or in their offices doing, you know, doing hero work or just out in the community. Right. Yeah. We're not getting any younger and I can verify that as of today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to our Happy audience, birthday, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks uh, again. To our audience. Thanks so much for tuning in. I wish we could get to, to, to a lot more of the comments and the, and the, points that were made. Uh, be sure to be a part of our March 25th event, free to attend, free to get involved. We want to hear from you. Um, you can learn more at supplychainoutreader.com, our podcast, find us and subscribe wherever you get your good news podcast from. On behalf of the entire team here, Scott Luton, wishing you a wonderful week ahead. Uh, we'll see you next time on Supply Chain Now. Stay safe, take the precautions, do it, show kindness, don't panic, Brighter days certainly lie ahead. Thanks, everybody.